Welcome to Made for Another World podcast with Aaron Alvarado and me, Jacob Simmons. Each week, we have distinct and stately conversations regarding Christian books, stories, songs, and sermons with the hopes that we'll walk away a little homesick for the world we were made for. Should we just scratch distinct and stately by now or just leave it in just as a lie? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, anyway. It's a good question. (laughs) Um... Maybe we can consider. Is it a is it a a good lie? Yeah. Also, so, it, I mean, how how distinct and how stately do you have to be to consider yourself distinct and right. stately? There's probably a little bit of us that's distinct and stately. Sure. So yeah. Uh-huh. So it's a truth. All right. Here we are. So we can keep it in. Keep it in. Yeah. Well, for now, this is episode thirteen, "The Heart of Christ" by Thomas Goodwin. Thomas, commonly referred to as the Elder, was born in the year 1600. He was an English Puritan theologian and preacher, and an important leader of religious independence. He served as chaplain to Oliver Cromwell, and was imposed by Parliament as president of Magdalen College, Oxford, in 1650. It's a long time ago. If you've ever read the wildly unpopular book, Gentle and Lowly, by Dane Ortland then you are most likely aware of this man because Dane even says that Goodwin is like the main protagonist of his book. He draws from, specifically, this very book quite extensively in Gentle and Lowly, and so we thought we'd take a closer look at the source. All right. So the point. Mm -hmm. The Heart of Christ, obviously, is a wonderful title. You don't necessarily need to expand on it, but uh, he does in his introduction. So... uh, he says, in this discourse, uh, it, it's going to lay open the heart of Christ as now he is in heaven, sitting at God's right hand and interceding for us. Uh, so number one, how it is affected and graciously disposed towards sinners on earth that do come to him. Number two, how willing to receive them. Number three, how ready to entertain them. Number four, how tender to pity them in all their infirmities, both sins and miseries. The scope and use whereof will be this, to hearten and encourage believers to come more boldly unto the throne of grace, unto such a Savior and high priest, when they shall know how sweetly and tenderly his heart, though he is now in glory, is inclined towards them. Hmm. So I think we can say, all right, that, cause that's, that's an exciting thing to even think yeah. about. Like a, I wonder though where that kind of discussion originated. Like, uh, I wonder who, th- who thought, oh, well, now that he's in glory, he's different. You know, like yeah. he's, he's, hmm. he's not as open towards sinners as he was while he was here on earth. I, I don't know if it was a discussion that, um, you know, maybe was prevalent in his day. And so maybe he felt like he should write about it. But right. um, to say, like, this is to hearten and encourage believers to come more boldly Onto the throne of grace. Mm. I like it. Yeah. I like it. Let's go. Yeah. And that's almost, <clears throat> what's the fr- oxymoron? I don't know if that's the right phrase or not, but boldly to the throne of grace. Like, <laughs> you know, go go with, with fervor to a place where you need grace. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what, I mean, it, it's fantastic and it's great and, and I, we need to do that as believers. But that's, like there, there's there's an element to that that makes it tricky, I guess. And again, we talk about this every episode, the difficulty of being a human and being a Christian and, and knowing how this works. Uh, but yeah, this is, that's a very exciting, yeah. very exciting opening. Hey, had you heard of Thomas Goodwin before? I've heard of him, yeah. I don't know that I've, I haven't read this before this episode. I don't know that I've read it, anything from him. Yeah. I don't think. I don't think I had either. Yeah. I mean, before Gentle and Lowly. Right. right. I'm not 100% sure I had heard of him. Because there's a couple that I get mixed together, like Thomas Watson, Thomas Goodwin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thomas Edison. Yeah. Yeah. All the great Puritans. Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, uh, so he's in reasons of, uh, like, kind of where this comes from, but he says, uh, for the third reason, It's to testify thus much by a real testimony what his, meaning Christ's, love would be when in heaven to them, the evangelist shows that when he was in the midst of all those great thoughts of his approaching glory, 
and of the sovereign estate which he was to be in, he then took water and a towel and washed his disciples' feet. This to have been his scope will appear, if you observe but the coherence in the second verse. It is said that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, then, in John 13, 4, he riseth from supper and lays aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. John 13, 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Where it is evident uh, that the evangelist's scope is to hold forth this unto us, that then, when Christ's thoughts were full of his glory, and when he took in con- in the consideration of it unto the utmost, even then, and upon that occasion, and in the midst of those thoughts, he washed his disciples' feet. Now, why? What was the mystery of this, his washing their feet? It was as to give them an example of mutual love and humility, so to signify his washing away their sins. Thus, John thirteen eight and 10, himself interprets it. It is true indeed that now he is in heaven, he cannot come to wash the feet of their bodies, but he would signify thus much thereby, that those sinners that will come to him when, uh, when in his glory, he will wash away all their sins. He loved his church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, Ephesians 5.25. Mm. <clears throat> what a beautiful picture, though. I mean, and to to see Christ washing the feet with water and a towel, uh, and then to see Christ washing our sins with his own blood, um, that is quite a, a, a different picture, <laughs> quite a different scene between those things, both still lovely and beautiful. Um, one, well, yeah, one far greater heavier sure more impact meh, maybe not impactful either <laughs> one, one seemed like it means man i don't want to get i don't want to get in trouble with this at all <laughs> but it's they're they're contrasting but yet the same yeah you know and and that's that's what's beautiful about the gospel i think we probably see that a lot of times throughout a lot of a lot of things that jesus did while he was here on earth you're going to see a lot of that kind of trending through his life and you see how that is displayed later on but um how cool would it i don't know if the cool is the right word but <laughs> to to have been one of the disciples that had their feet washed by jesus like man and i can sit here and say man how that's that's crazy like you know that they had that opportunity yet i've had my sins washed by his blood and how how great what a cool opportunity you know <laughs> like, it's awesome well, I think it's important, too, because the the whole point of the book, like you said, is to reveal to us the heart of Christ so that we can come to him m- more boldly, right? And so to say, he's about to go back with his father. He's about to be in glory. <clears throat> and that is going to be far greater than having been on this earth. Uh, he, he's about to go and have that, but... Even now, like his mind is full of what's about to happen, mm-hmm. and he stoops down, he humbles himself, he yeah. to wash their dirty feet, and uh, like if that's, and I think this is what he he's getting at. Like if that's the heart of Christ, while he was here, it's still his heart. Like yeah. he's still going to be um, that kind of gentle, that kind of lowly, if you will. Um, but even even more so, uh, because it's not just feet that he's washing. Yeah. Um, it's our our we mm-hmm. are washed, yeah. you know, and that is yeah. beautiful. A mm-hmm. little bit further in the book, it says it is the manner of bridegrooms when they've made all ready in their father's house, then to come themselves and fetch their brides, and not to sin for them by others, because it is a time of love. Love descends better than ascends, and so does the love of Christ, who indeed is love itself, and therefore comes down to us himself. He says, uh, I will come again and receive you unto myself, says Christ, that so where I am, you may be also. That last part of his speech gives the reason of it, and also divulges his entire affection. It is as if he had said, the truth is, I cannot live without you. 
I shall never be quiet until I have you where I am. That so, uh, that so we may never part again. That is the reason of it. Heaven shall not hold me, nor my father's company, if I have not you with me. My heart is so set upon you, and if I have any glory, you shall have part of it. So John fourteen nine, because I live, you shall live also. Mm. I love that it's a Puritan that wrote something like that. Mm. Because it makes me feel a little safer than if yeah. um, somebody m- modern had written that. And maybe that's a, a bias that I need to check myself on. But uh, to say something like, uh, I cannot live without you. In certain contexts, that's, uh, I want to say almost cheap. Mm-hmm. It, it's a it's like a throwaway kind of line. Like, yeah. Jesus loves you. It, it's like, but there, there's more depth to that. Um, if you would pick it apart, and that's exactly what he does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I love that it's not just like, um, oh, here, here's a, a random throwaway sentence. It's like, no, uh, the truth is I cannot live without you. And then he says, because of this is what it says in scripture, mm-hmm. this is what Christ is saying. Right. But So I, I love that, number one. But then number two, for that to be the heart of Christ right. is, I, I, <clears throat> it's astounding because I know... I'm not worthy of it. I know I, I can give I can give Christ thousands of reasons, mm. but I still on on an from an earthly perspective, um like when I'm away from my wife, when I'm away from my kids, I miss them. I, mm. I love them. I want like there's a sense in which my joy is not full. <clears throat> I can't imagine going to like the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone and not taking my kids or my wife, like it, not them not being with me would that'd be a really sad trip to Yellowstone. It's a beautiful place, but if I don't have them with me, it's really kind of meaningless. Yeah. Um, and sort of think if that's true of me from an earthly perspective, and I'm and I'm mm. a marred, but but still an image of of Christ, then uh, that's that's the way that. The text is saying he feels about us, and that's right. That's mind blowing. Mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I like he. Uh, what did he say? Uh, if I have any glory, you shall have part of it. Like, whew, man. And like you alluded to, like we have to be careful how you know the context of this saying something like that. Um, I always, it's always like a moment when you say Jesus or God cannot, you know what I mean? Like that's because God can, like he can do anything. Um, I mean, things he can't, he can't go against his own character, you know, all those things. But the, for, to, to say that he cannot, like we have to know it doesn't mean that he literally cannot, like he, he can, he, he can have heaven without us if he wants to. But, like you said, he goes on and reads in Scripture, like, hey, he, I, I don't want to say change the words to he won't, but, like, like there, there's a there's a, an essence there that says, no, he cannot, because that is not how he planned it. It's not how he laid it out. It's not his will to be there without that, and that would go against his will, so he cannot. So, so it all makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but, but like you said, I mean, to think that that's even a consideration of him to think about us that way. I mean, just, oh, man, yeah. so good. Okay, so the the first part of the book deals with uh, while he was still on earth, showing showing us what the heart of Christ is now, and then the second part he gets into uh, after he's ascended into heaven. So here's from part of this. It says, and when you pray, it is the spirit that indicts, which means composes or dictates your prayers and that makes intercession for you in your own hearts romans eight twenty six, which such intercession of his is but the evidence and echo of christ's intercession in heaven the spirit prays in you because christ prays for you he is an intercessor on earth because christ is an intercessor in heaven as he did take off christ's words and use the same that he before had uttered when he spoke in and to the disciples the words of life So he takes off of Christ's prayers also when he prays in us. He takes but the words, as it were, out of Christ's mouth, or heart rather, and directs our hearts to offer them up to God. 
He also follows us to the sacrament, and in that glass shows us Christ's face smiling on us, and through his face, his heart, and thus helping of us to a, to a sight of him. We go away rejoicing that we saw our Savior today. How humbling uh, to think the Spirit prays in us because Christ prays for us. Uh, we ask for prayer. As Christians, we ask for prayer a lot, right? We have prayer requests all, all the time, whether it's church or just between friends. Um, like I ask you, hey, man, can you, can you pray for this thing? Can you know ask the pastor, hey, can you pray for this thing or whatever? Like that's, and that's, uh, comforting and encouraging to have someone else praying for me. <laughs> but no offense, and I don't think you'll take any, but you're not Christ. <laughs> Christ is praying for me. Like Christ is praying for you. Like that's, we can't even wrap our minds around that. Like another one of those, I get it, but it doesn't make sense moments. And to know that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, of God himself is within us, leading us through our prayers, causing us to pray. I mean, like, there is so much power there that we have, that not that we have, but that is it is there for us because of the Spirit to Christ, to the Father. Like, it just, it is so, like, it's exciting and humbling and all, all the emotions, all the things, and I just love it. I love it. Yeah, uh, it's an older theologian. I don't remember who exactly it was, but um, said, uh, how, "What would it do for your heart if you knew Christ was in the next room praying for you?" Yeah, um, and it's like distance m- make, makes no difference. Yeah, he's praying for you. And it's like Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, um, but specifically, like part of what we read here. <clears throat> talking about the Lord's Supper, uh, saying, we go away rejoicing that we saw our Savior that day. Uh, we, we've talked about this a couple of times, I think, as well, but uh, how something like the Lord's Supper can be joyful. It's something that we can do uh, with a smile on our faces because it's a, it's an, it's a, it's a sobering act. It, it's saying, I'm forsaking all else to, to trust in Christ in this moment, but uh, but on the flip side of that, you're trusting in Christ, and that's a joyful endeavor, and that's mm-hmm. a um, to to run away from your sin and to say, I am in need of this body and blood, but I have it. Like that's a that's a good day, yeah. and that's um, the there's so much joy that's wrapped up in that. Um, just kind of thing that that can be taken advantage of or mm. not taken advantage of t- uh taken for granted yes yeah couldn't yeah, think I'm of any words there yeah <laughs> thank you um so i i like that he brought that in there yeah it's good a little bit further he says god the father has given jesus christ a special command to love sinners and has further implanted a merciful, gracious disposition in his heart toward them. This I mention to argue it, because it is that which Christ alleges in John 6.37 as the original ground of this disposition of his, not to cast out those that come to him. For it is my Father's will, says he in the following verses, that I should perform that which I came down from heaven for, John 6.38. And this lies now still upon him, now he is in heaven, as much as ever. For his will also is, says he in John six thirty nine and 40, that I should raise them up at the last day. So as it must necessarily continue the same till then. And compare this with John ten fifteen through 18, where having discoursed before of his care and love to his sheep to give his life for them, to know and own them and to bring them into the fold, he concludes at John ten eighteen. This commandment have I received from my Father. It is his will, says John 6, and if a good son knows that a thing is his Father's mind and will, it is enough to move him to do it, much more if it be his express command. And in this, John 10, he further says that it is the command which he had received from the Father. A command is a man's will parentorily expressed, so as there must be a breach, 
if it not be fulfilled. And such a command has God given Christ concerning us. Mm. Now, I've heard, I've heard many ways that, that the, the love of Christ, I've, I've heard it described in many ways. Um, you don't hear that very often, though, mm. that God has literally commanded Christ yeah. to love us in that way. Now, uh, I think he, he makes the argument either before or after this that um, like Christ's heart loves us, and so that would be enough, but he's also, <clears throat> he's commanded, and so he's going to obey his Father. Mm-hmm. And that's a, all of this is so mind-blowing, <laughs> but for that to be true of, of someone like me is, I, I, I cannot fully grasp that. I, yeah. I can't. I, I will always wrestle with that. If because if I truly understood it, I would never sin again. Right. Mm. And yet Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> I but to <laughs> speechless. Exactly. I'm speechless. Yeah. 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 And it it's always um tricky, I guess, when you're reading about Christ's obedience to the Father. Cause you and I, like we think of obedience Typically, it's something that's like we're told to do that maybe we don't necessarily want to do, right? It's like, oh, I need to be obedient because my parents said I need to do this. Or you expect your children to be obedient when you ask them or tell them to do something. The, our, our earthly view of obedience isn't always a positive thing. You know, it's like, man, it could be, you know, we have we need to be obedient because we're not doing what we should be doing. Where with Christ, it's not like, oh, he could have disobeyed God like it. No, because they're the same God, <laughs> but different people, persons in the God. <laughs> so, like, it, it's a, another point that's just kind of like, this almost doesn't make sense. Like, how does, like you said, it's he's commanded to love us, but not because he didn't. Not because, hey, Jesus, you're not loving those people the way you need to. You need to. You need to love them. Okay, I'll be obedient. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's it, it's all the same, and it's yeah. it's almost like he's commanding himself, in a sense, right? Because yeah. he's they're all the same God. So it's still it's another one of those doesn't make any sense, but it does make sense. But I love that because it's he's commanded to do something that he wants to do like you said it's it's part of his heart to do it anyways so it's almost like a double like i love you so much and i'm commanded to do it so that's how much i love you (laughs) but good stuff yeah i love you so much and i'm going to obey the command yeah to love you yeah that's even more love (laughs) i like it a little bit further on so he's getting into uh talking about the offices of Christ. So, uh, prophet, priest, king, uh, and, and how those relate back to the heart of Christ. But so he starts with, uh, the office of high priesthood is altogether an office of grace. And I may call it the pardon office set up and erected by God in heaven and Christ. He is appointed the Lord and master of it. And as his kingly office is an office of power and dominion, and his prophetical office an office of knowledge and wisdom, so his priestly office is an office of grace and mercy. The high priest's office did properly deal in nothing else. If there had not been a mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, the high priest had not at all been appointed to have gone into it. It was mercy and reconciliation and atonement for sinners that he was to treat about, and so to officiate for uh, and so to officiate for at the mercy seat. He had had otherwise no work nor anything to do when he should come into the most holy place. The qualification that was required in a high priest was that he should be one that could have compassion. And this is set forth in Hebrews 5 too. He that was high priest was not chosen into that office for his deep wisdom, great power, or exact holiness, but for the mercy and compassion that was in him. That is it. Uh, that is it which is here made the special, and therefore the only mentioned property in a high priest as such, and the special essential qualification that was inwardly and internally to, con- to constitute him and fit him for that office as God's appointment did outwardly and externally, as Hebrews 5 has it. Has it. And the word dunamenos, that can or is able, imports an inward faculty, a spirit, a disposition, a heart that knows how to be compassionate. And it is the same word that the apostle had used, uh, 
had before used to express Christ's heart by, even in the words of the text, dunaminos, sum, sympathese. Don't ask me. Yeah, <laughs> sympathese. That is, who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And he had also used it of him that alone, uh, of him afore that, in the point of mercy in Hebrews 2.18. Uh, dunatai, he is able to succor, which is not meant of any external power, which we usually call ability, but of an internal touch in his will. He has a heart able to forgive and to afford help. I know we've mentioned it before, um, but the fact that the mercy seat like, why does it exist? Well, mm. for mercy. Yeah. That's literally the, the title of it. That's mm. the name of it. And so, uh, it would make sense then that he who goes into that mercy seat is a merciful guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you wouldn't want to have a, a military power guy right. running that necessarily. You know, um, you wouldn't want to have a great philosopher running that. You would want to have somebody who had a, a heart of compassion, especially mm. if... Um, especially if I'm in need of mercy, right? If I, <laughs> I, I want to go to that guy mm. over, over and above the other two and yet to, that, that Christ is, is all three, prophet, priest, and king. Um, he, he is all powerful. He is Lord of all and he has all wisdom and all knowledge and yet even with all of that, he still has a heart that has mercy and is ever compassionate toward his 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 people mm. um it, i it's so simple but i love that it's brought out in this book and i and i i think it's been brought up in a book before but uh that the whole point of the seat is is mercy mm. and and that's where christ is 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 for us yeah Be, just beautiful yeah and it makes me think of um uh, how we've talked about other the religions of the world and all the other quote unquote gods of all these religions um and I, i'm not a a studier or philosopher or something else of <laughs> of religions of the world i know a little bit uh but i i don't know that there's another mercy seat in any of these religions mm-hmm. um and we've talked about how like the the difference is I mean, the the whole gospel is saturated in mercy, right? I mean, there's a, there's a strong connection between mercy and grace, right? And you don't see that with these other religions, with these other gods. And so, to have that mercy, like you said, for someone who needs mercy, yeah, I, I need that daily. You know, I need those new mercies every single day. You find that in Christ, and you don't find that anywhere else. There's no other religion where it's, I mean, it's... Do, do, do what you can, and then come to me, and then I'll let you know if I accept you because you did a good job, as opposed to, I have so much mercy for you because you can't, 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 and so you're mine, and that's just so beautiful, and again, I'm just referencing other books and episodes, it seems like a bunch, but I mean, there, it's, there's such a contrast between what we have, what we know is true, and then what other people think is true. And I just love that about how Christianity differs from all those other religions that are just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> truly. Yeah, truly. In the greatest sense of yes. the word. Yes. A little bit further, he writes, There is comfort concerning infirmities, and that your very sins move him to pity more than to anger. This text is plain for it, for he suffers with us under our infirmities, and by infirmities are meant sins, as well as other miseries, as was proved. While therefore you look on them as infirmities, as God here looks upon them and speaks of them in his own, and as your disease, and complain to Christ of them, and do cry out, O miserable man that I am, who shall deliver me? Romans 7. So fear not long. Christ takes part with you and is so far from being provoked against you as all his anger is turned upon your sin to ruin it. Yes, his pity is increased the more towards you, even as the heart of a father is to a child that has some loathsome disease, or as one is a member 
Or as one is to a member of his body that has the leprosy, he hates not the member, for it's his flesh, but the disease. And that provokes him to pity the part affected the more. What shall not make for us? Uh, what shall not make for us when our sins, which are both against Christ and us, shall be turned as motives to him to pity us the more? The object of pity is one in misery whom we love, and the greater the misery is, the more is the pity when the party is beloved. Now, all, now of all miseries, sin is the greatest, and while yourselves look at it as such, Christ will look upon it as such only also in you, and he loving your persons and hating only the sin. His hatred shall all fall, and that only upon the sin, to free you of it by its ruin and destruction. But his bowels shall be the more drawn out to you, and this as much when you lie under sin as any as under any other affliction. Therefore fear not. What shall separate us from Christ's love? Mm-hmm. That That is absolutely beautiful Mm -hmm. uh that as as deep as i know my sin to be uh as as much of an infirmity if if you will as much of a disease or a sickness as i understand my sin to be christ knows even more so how much it is Mm -hmm. but there's a his heart is such that I'm starting to sound like him a little bit. It's such that um, it, it has so much compassion. It has so much mercy that he looks upon it and he sees it as a disease. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it, I love that, that that's brought in. Like if you see your family member, if you see somebody you love with a disease, you don't hate them. Mm-hmm. You hate the disease. You want to rid them of the disease. And what greater disease is there than sin? And that that's a beautiful way to put that and and not while not excusing it you know it's not like god loves you the way you are like it's it's way deeper than that yeah. it's no he sees it it's an infirmity it's sin but that causes him somehow to it causes his heart somehow to go out to you even further mm. <laughs> what <laughs> hey, and he even says uh yeah. Like his his bowels, so his his heart, everything about him mm-hmm. is for you uh, when you lie under that sin. Mm. And if that does not go against everything in my body that I believe, mm-hmm. that I want to think in that moment, it's like, no, Christ would he would run from me now. He'd be so disappointed. He'd he'd turn his face from me. Yeah. Nope. For him to come even more so to me, it's drawn out to me in that. Mm-hmm. I t- uh, my goodness and and again harping playing this playing the same harp strumming the same tune on the harp <laughs> again the complete opposite of of these other gods of these religions like the worse off you do the worse off you are you know the the, the less you accomplish for me as your god uh no get away from me oh you 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 didn't do as much as this guy uh, you get a little farther away from me as opposed to, oh, you've sinned this much, I'm coming after you more. Oh, you you sinned this much, oh, I'm coming after you even more. Like, it doesn't, like, <laughs> the amount of grace and mercy that is in that is just mind-blowing. Again, we'll just keep saying that, I guess. Yeah. And thank God for it. <laughs> yeah. Because we would be so, there would be no point to anything at all, ever, whatsoever, if it wasn't for the true gospel. And I don't, I'm not going to sit here and say, I don't know why anybody can believe anything else. I get how people, you know, believe things. Uh, you know, it, it happens. I, I get it. But when you just taste and see, and you'll know that this God is good, that this Lord is good, the chubby little bald guy that you're worshiping, that isn't, it's not. It's not worth your time, you know. It's literally not worth your time because it's going to ruin all of your time yeah. forever. But how, I mean, just how how beautiful the the one the one thing the one person that should be the most disgusted by any amount of sin, let alone the most amount of sin, is the one that still says, "No, I care for you even more now." Oh man, yeah, Whew. that's yeah. good. No other, no other God, no. It's only that one. Yeah. Man. 
Very good. Very good. <clears throat> well, we've come to our last quote. Uh, we did it pretty quickly, but it's a shorter book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a good way to end it. So it says, In all miseries and distresses, you may be sure to know where to have a friend to help and pity you, even in heaven, Christ. One whose nature, office, interest, relation, all do engage him to your succor. You will find men, even friends, to be oftentimes unto you unreasonable. And their bowels, in many cases, shut up towards you. Will say to them all, if you will not pity me, choose. I know one that will. One in heaven, whose heart is touched with the feeling of all my infirmities. And I will go and bemoan myself to him. Come boldly, says the text even with open mouth, to lay open your complaints, and you shall find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Men love to see themselves pitied by friends, though they cannot help them. Christ can and will do both. Mm. In all miseries and distresses, not just some, not most, in all, and in, in our time of need. So... I know I can oftentimes feel like I'm not in a time of need, right? Like if I'm, I mean, I'm doing really well. I, I woke up this morning and went straight to the Bible, you know, had whatever, sang a worship song on the way to work, whatever it is. I'm having a good day. Things are going good. That's still a time of need. Like I, I still need Christ to help. Maybe it is a good day so far. I need his help to help that continue to be a good day it's not like uh you know hey i'm doing okay right now right. like for a christian to ever think that there is a moment that we are not in need that's essentially to say that we're not a christian right yeah. we are 100 percent of the time in need of christ no matter how well or how unwell things are so we need to remember that he's always there in our time of need and we are always in our time of need so he's always <laughs> oh, there man. you know it's beautiful, beautiful. Ah. well beautiful exception <laughs> <laughs> uh but truly man that's yeah. that's a really good way to put it it's there in our time of need yeah which is always always yeah so he's always there always there. man uh so the heart of christ the we we pulled out some some parts of it but essentially it's that uh the the heart of christ is for us and why I think this is an important book is because that's exactly what we have a hard time believing, mm-hmm. want to not believe at times, yeah. and in our sinfulness, cannot fathom, right? Yeah. Like that's that's truly, I think that's what it, what it gets down to, at least for me personally. The, I, I can't put together how God is, is merciful and gracious toward me, a sinner, but when I look at Christ and I see his heart for me and toward me, I, I feel even more guilt over my sin and more shame. And yet that makes his heart go out toward me. Mm-hmm. And then the very sin that I'm in makes his heart go out toward me. I I can't escape. Can't escape it. <laughs> and I, it makes me feel so safe, yeah. so loved. And so it's a, it's a highly important book for that reason. Yeah. And uh so i i love it yeah. heart of christ great yeah great i forgot to mention at the very start mm-hmm. very beginning both genesis oh, the yeah. the outset mm-hmm. uh that it's it's all based on matthew 11 that's come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Uh, and we're, we're piggybacking off of gentle and lowly here, mm-hmm. but essentially Christ is saying, Here's, here is who I am. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Yeah. The, the high priest that is always compassionate. Uh, I'm the perfect candidate for that office, and I'm here. Yeah. come to me at at any point at any time uh whether it's the middle of the night or or you're having a great day you're always in your time of need and my heart is always for you and when it feels like you should be furthest away from me 
that's when I'm closest to you in a <laughs> sense. Oh, yeah. J- fantastic. <laughs> Man, that's good. Yeah. Well, that was how I was going to end it was with Matthew 11. So well, there you go. Well, I should have started with it, but then we ended with it. So that's a good way to end it. It is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and start it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, join us next week as we will be broadcasting to you from Dawson's Creek mm. with a member of the Castaway crew. Ooh. Well, sir. Until then, this has been Aaron Alvarado and me, Jacob Simmons. And we are Made for Another World. Nice. <laughs> In all miseries, I'll wait till you're done. (laughs) (laughs) Why are you looking at me like that? (laughs) You said. Me too. (laughs) 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 Welcome to Made for Another. Got all sorts of stuff happening.